Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ruth McCambridge, and I'm the editor in chief of the nonprofit Quarterly. And um, I'm very pleased today to bring you a webinar that has been so incredibly well registered for that we're afraid, in fact, we're going to be an overflow crowd. Um, so if any of your friends complain later that they weren't able to get on, tell them that it was just a technological issue. Um, so the webinar this afternoon is called How to Build a Dashboard for Your Nonprofit, um, A Critical Strategic Tool Reveals Itself. And I want to say something just um, on, a, a, on the level of kind of personal experience with this is that we swear by our dashboard at NPQ. Um, we use it as a common discussion tool, not just internally, but also with our funders. Um, and it has it has been basically a miracle worker in terms of coherent conversations so that our stakeholders understand really um, everybody understands the basics of what they're looking at when they look at us. Um, a well-designed dashboard shows whether a nonprofit is making headway on its critical variables. Um, and these variables extend far beyond finances in some cases to programmatic issues and operating issues. The variables um, that are addressed on any particular dashboard differ from one group to another, but a tailored dashboard organizes and focuses conversations and keeps them moving among various stakeholder groups. Many nonprofit leaders still are very confused about what the key indicators should be, however, and how they should be portrayed on a report so that they're easily understandable and discussable. NPQ is very proud to present this event, and it features um, one of our favorite presenters, Hilda Pol Polanco, who is the founder and CEO of Fiscal Management Associates. But we will also today be joined by two panelists, Krista Gannon, Executive Director and Founder of Fresh Lifelines for Youth, and Jenny Ocon, um, Executive Director of Up Valley Family Centers. Um, I want to really um, express deep appreciation for the two panelists for sharing the information that they you know, of, about how they use their dashboards. Because, you know, all of us in some way or another consider that information fairly intimate. I think the dashboard actually helps you to understand how to share things so that you don't feel so vulnerable when you are sharing them. So, uh, but I do want to thank you for being willing to do this. Um, we are sponsored. That's how we were able to bring this to you free. And um, so today's workshop is brought to you by AccuFund, which is a nonprofit financial management specialist helping thousands of nonprofits improve their overall financial management by streamlining your processes, improving efficiencies, and lowering costs. They share their solutions both in person and, and over the cloud, and their reporting capabilities and intuitive dashboards enable sound decision making and strategic execution of your mission. AccuFund integration integrates technology, consulting services, and industry best practices to provide a unique financial solution. This webinar will be recorded. Um, so I see we've already gotten one question <laughs> asking you if you'll be able to access it later. It absolutely will be accessible later. So you can share it around with your friends, with your board members, and et cetera. So you will get um, the slides and um, and the recording shortly after the meeting. We will also make this webinar freely available on our website, so you can always go back and, and uh, download it later and watch it. Um, we will leave time for your questions at the end. You can ask those questions anytime you please. So if somebody's talking about something and you just need some clarification or you have a, you know, you want you want them to explain something more, feel free at any point during the process to just log your questions into the question panel on the lower right hand side of your screen. That um, I, I will keep an eye on those questions and we'll either answer them during 
the presentation if they're immediate, or we'll, we'll have a, the question and answer period at the very end, which allows me to ask more of those questions um, that haven't been addressed. Um, finally, we are on social media today, so you can follow today's conversation with hashtag build your dashboard and that way you can let other people know that this resource is available to them and you know as our panelists make brilliant statements you can quote them um, hopefully they'll keep it short so it's quotable and tweetable <laughs> but not keep it not keep the content short but but provide some real um, jewels for tweeting um, so Back to the topic today, what you will learn is the value of the basic process for establishing and maintaining a dashboard, how to choose the metrics you track, how the information is used with your various stakeholder groups, and how to think about the graphic design. So with that, I want to hand the session over to Hilda, and thank you very much, Hilda, for bringing this topic back to us again and actually grounding it even more um, in the experiences of these two excellent nonprofits. Thank you, Ruth. It's always a pleasure to be with you and be with the constituents of NPQ. I also am thrilled to have my panelists with me today. We look forward to sharing our insights and our work and to answering the questions you might have. Um, at the end of the program. I want to uh, in, uh, just share with you that the dashboard process, um, if one Googles the term these days, there are thousands of entries. It's the sexy finance term of the year. And um, it's because it makes really complicated information more um, attainable, more understandable, and helps those perhaps that don't feel that finance is their strength or any other numeric um, component of managing an organization and can look to the, the charts and the pictures to really tell the story. I have had the pleasure of working with these two panelists and I'm really thrilled to have them um, with us. Krista is, as you mentioned, the founder and CEO of Fresh Lifelines for Youth, um, lovingly referred to as FLY. And Jenny Okong is the executive director of Valley Family Centers. Um, Krista is in the, um, they're both on the, on the West Coast, um, in the Bay Area and in um, the Napa Valley area. So I'm gonna let each one of them introduce themselves and just a little bit about um, the organization its budget size, and um, just a little bit about its business model. Krista, why don't you uh, introduce yourself first? Great, thank you so much for having us. This is really fun to get to do. Um, FLY is an organization that's in the Bay Area. We believe that all our children deserve a chance to be more than their past mistakes. And we specialize in working with kids that are in the juvenile justice system or at risk of system involvement. So today, uh, we are an organization that is around a six million dollar budget, 60 staff, about 200 employees, and we work across three different counties in the Bay Area, and within those counties, about 23 different cities. Um, and we run a number of different uh, programs. Uh, we have uh, five or six different program models that we operate. Some are in all counties, some are just in the few counties. Back when we embarked on this dashboard process for ourselves, um, it was about four years ago, and we were about four and a half million dollars um, at the time. And our funding model is mixed. So about a third government, a third foundations and corporations, and about a third individual. So I'll Thank pause there. Stop it. Thank you. That was great background. Uh, Jenny, could you uh, share with everyone a little bit about the organization? Sure. Uh, my name is Jenny, of course, and I'm, I am part of the Up Valley Family Centers. So the Up Valley Family Centers, we operate two family resource centers in the northern part of Napa County, which is rural communities, Calistoga and St. Helena. And uh, we are here to serve people of all ages from babies up through seniors. Our annual budget is about $1.9 million. We have about 20 staff in these two communities. And what we are here to do is provide an array of resources to keep families healthy and strong. Uh, and and support them in their local community in culturally accessible formats. 
So uh, in terms of our business model, we are also about a third foundations, a third uh, government support, and then a third uh, our individual or corporate donors or special events. Thank you. Okay. Well, before we um, go forward, I wanted to share from a framing perspective where we believe dashboards fit in into the overall management and governance of an organization. And dashboards are really a tool for performance management. Performance management is what helps us all first think about where we're heading and what our strategic goals are, and then how we are performing against those goals. And in order to do that, there are several tools that we all use in leadership. The performance management via the dashboard is really one of the most um, strategic tools that we've seen. The measurement cycle begins with um, defining your goals. And in defining the goals, you're really defining what you intend to measure, uh, what impact is important to you. And to get there, you want to identify what we call key performance indicators. It's um, another very sexy term, the KPIs. And key performance indicators are those indicators that will really keep the leadership focused on what is important. And the key to key is that it be just a few, maybe a handful of indicators that you've identified are your key drivers. Once you've defined these indicators, it's a matter of implementing the dashboard. And in that perspective, our words of encouragement are to be consistent, to be consistent in the data entry and in the interpretation and in what is presented from month to month or, or quarter to quarter. Once we've defined and started the implementation process, there's a cycle process of monitoring. The monitoring process allows us to see how we're doing against those goals. As Ruth mentioned, it's about clarifying how the organization is doing against its performance. We track these trends in metrics um, as well as the process itself. The metrics are those key indicators that we'll talk a little bit more about um, today in terms of thinking about them and, um, and, and reporting on them. The process you'll find is really important. The process needs to be an inclusive process. We are not describing a process whereby the CFO, CFO or the executive director goes in a room, defines the KPIs, comes back, and um, is part of the dashboard. That's not the goal. The goal here is to have the leadership together determine what's important as part of the strategy, and then identify what will be measured. So the process is important, as you'll learn from our panelists. As we develop the process and we've got these metrics, there's an evaluation process. The evaluation is, is really about what's working and what isn't, and it's a learning process. I have seen um, organizations develop a dashboard and uh, try it out for a little bit, see what's working, what's not working, and then refine until we get to a place that we're really pleased with. And once we've done that, we're back to defining again. So the process of developing a dashboard is not, um, is not a very, very short process. It's not a very long process. It's about the process, the time that you give it to go through these five elements that I've um, outlined here. In terms of what should we measure, um, we believe that there are many areas of an organization that can be the basis for determining your KPIs and which ones you choose are based on your priorities. A dashboard can cover anything from financial health to the development strategy to the program area. You can see all the way through um, uh, with human capital and, and talent development all the way through facilities. So this is not to say that every organization should have KPIs in all of the nine functional areas that we have here. It's to say that the priorities could actually be in one of these nine areas and it's up to you and your team in that definition phase to determine what is important at the organizational level. You may decide that for the leadership of each of these functional areas, there may be deeper dive dashboards that help them identify what are the leading indicators that they need to be aware of in order to accomplish the KPIs that are significantly important for the organization as a whole. And so with this framework in terms of what 
um, the dashboards could track. I want to turn it now to our panelists to basically ask them a few questions about how they thought about it. And I'm going to begin um, with a very general question for each. And I'm going to start with Krista and then Jenny will, will follow. Um, and it's a question of what were the challenges that the organization was facing when you began? Um, the dashboard, as I mentioned, is a mechanism for tracking strategies. So when you began the process, what were those challenges? And were there any specific questions that you were hoping the dashboard process would answer for you with regard to where you were heading? Um, Krista, do you want to share some thoughts on, on what those were for you? Sure. Um, there were a number of challenges. Um, and to just be very candid, one of them was me. So as a founder, I was still very heavily involved in how we managed tracked, documented our financial health. Um, and at the time we were a four and a half million dollar organization and, and felt that, that that wasn't the way that we should be going, that it should be much more systematized um, and that we should get me out of it. <laughs> so that was that was one challenge was kind of dealing with elevating my line of sight as the founder and CEO. The other challenge was we were going through a really intensive theory of change process um, to really get clear and define what was our biggest impact how did we want to make sure that we were a learning organization and maximized our programs and what they could offer the community with the ultimate end game being that we really anticipated that within a few years we would be expanding into a new jurisdiction. So we, that was a challenge, an opportunity that was on the horizon. And tied to that, given that we had such heavily restricted dollars, two thirds of our dollars were restricted, we didn't have a whole lot of money that we could play with and use for innovation or R&D or growth and scale. And we didn't really have a good handle on what we were buying and where we were buying it with our unrestricted dollars. Um, so that was kind of the third challenge. And then I think the fourth challenge was as we were growing as an organization and with elevating our board and really helping them have the optimal line of sight. And um, what we were finding was how we were communicating programmatic outcomes or how we were um, communicating our financial outcomes was very nuanced and dense. Um, and so for board members that were, that was their thing, we took them way down into the weeds when that wasn't where they needed to be. And then for board members that were really strategic and generative, they weren't empowered with the tools where they could participate in those conversations in a meaningful way because we weren't distilling the information in a way that was digestible. So those are some of the challenges that we were really trying to tackle when we embarked on this process. Thank you. And I heard you say earlier that the four and a half million is now over six million. So congratulations on that. And um, we'll look for a few other questions uh, in terms of how maybe the dashboard helped you with some critical questions as you uh, as you were going through that growth trajectory. Jenny, um, challenges, questions you were looking to answer when you started the dashboard process? Yeah. So one of the things uh, when we started looking at this dashboard process, we had not come very far out of a merger. So the history of our organizations is that we had two smaller nonprofit family resource centers. The boards of those two decided to merge. We officially merged in 2014, and we began the da dashboard development conversation in our 2015-2016 year. One of the things that I think as a newly merged organization, we felt the dashboard could help us with is to really establish a baseline around what is, what, what is our budget really looking like now that we've merged? What do our programs look like? Uh, what do we expect we're able to do around fundraising? And so, because there were many challenges to get through um, once the merger happened, the two organizations had been on different fiscal years, we um, were in a community where some of the donors overlapped both communities. We weren't really sure um, what, how once we merged, things would all play out. And so it was an opportunity for us for both at kind of our senior, senior staff leadership as well as our board to um, identify some specific areas in the areas of financial and the areas of program and in the areas of fundraising and communications where we thought you know would be important for us to track and have conversations and in a way establish some form of the baseline for the new organization so that's how we felt like it would help us both at board and at staff levels to really kind of track on what we felt were important um, as we started off on this journey of a new uh, unified organization 
Thank you, Jenny. That's a great point with regard to the life post merger. We've worked with organizations in that stage, and I remember one um, CEO saying, um, I wish I had had a playbook, not the one leading to the merger, the one after it. So the idea that together um, the team would use the dashboard to define this playbook seems, um, seems like it, it was probably really, really helpful. In terms of um, the definition of the metrics, I started my original thoughts with definition is the first step to a dashboard. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what were the key metrics that you all uh, thought about. And in identifying those metrics, I think um, those joining us today will have a, a sense as to what you deemed important uh, in terms of what areas they covered and um, specifically why you chose those metrics versus many, many more that were on um, the potential chart that you could have. Krista, um, with respect to uh, Fresh Lifelines for Youth um, dashboard, we have here on the slide the indicators, and again, as Ruth said, thank you for sharing this with us. And I'm going to let you address um, all of them, some of them with the ones you thought you really would, um, that would really be uh, most helpful to the audience with regard to why you chose them and how they've helped uh, come to, to where you are. Please share with us. Sure, and I, I'll name at the outset. I think that the process of creating the dashboard really illuminates some cultural DNA um, of the organization. For us, what came out is this tension of wanting to be all things to all people all the time. And so when we initially thought about the metrics, we had a whiteboard that was just full of everything you can possibly imagine. And so for us, it really became about a process about, okay, first of all, which metrics are important and then for whom are they important? So really starting with the board and thinking, what does the board need to see to optimize their line of sight? So what's happened since then is we have a CEO dashboard, we have a dashboard that our directors look at, we have a separate talent dashboard, a separate program dashboard. So this process really illuminated for us how much we cared about wanting to look at a variety of different factors. And so then what you see here is really where we solidified is to this is what we want the board to be seen on a quarterly basis. We were in the process of elevating our board and also moving our board from meeting bi-monthly, quarterly. And so that was also a, a part of what we were really aiming at. I will note too that initially for the first few years, our dashboard also did have talent metrics on it um, and also had some programmatic metrics on it, which after going through this for a while, we took those off and now we have a separate talent presentation once a year where they go a deeper dive in some of their metrics and we have a separate program presentation once a year. So for us, the, the biggest factors we were dealing with at the time when we created this was finance and fundraising. So that was where we really wanted to shift the board's attention. Um, and really, because we were operating in a variety of different counties and we had a variety of different programs and we were trying to balance allocation of restricted versus unrestricted dollars, that's why we chose really looking at what were our budgets and actuals by program, by county, um, and also what was our net asset balance composition. Because we also were dealing with, I'm sure some of us, we all empathize with the struggle of temporary restricted net assets and having these multi-year grants or these off-cycle grants and how do you book it and when do you release it. And we had just created, we had made it much more complicated for ourselves than it needed to be. And so we really wanted to work on how do we best book and release money so the money we do have is unrestricted money and get a better sense of where our unrestricted assets are. So that's why we really spent, wanted to look at Luna wanted to look at our net balance, our asset composition, how much was restricted, how much was unrestricted. And also in this process, we have an investment policy that we were working on that we wanted to make sure we always had the appropriate amount of cash on hand. So we wanted to make sure that we were putting that in front of the board. Um, so the finance piece is really around how do we empower the board to make informed decisions about growth and scale and whether programs are scaling up or scaling down Factoring in, are programs paying for themselves? Do we need to really exercise fundraising efforts um, for unrestricted dollars? Where are we making some strategic choices? And the board wasn't really empowered to have those conversations. Um, and so likewise on fundraising, we really wanted to look at where is our money coming from? How are we doing with restricted versus unrestricted? And, and we also were really um, very candid with our board about the expectations for them with fundraising, both their own individual investments as well as raising it. And so as a board, we set a collective goal um, that then we rolled up in the dashboard. So every time we were talking about fundraising, they could really look at their performance and engagement as a board um, and have a very clear metric around it. 
So really for us, these metrics really were helping us tee us up for how do we make decisions about growth and scale? How do we clean up our temporary restricted net assets so that what we're looking at, we have a better sense for what we can spend, um, what's the money we have to invest? Um, and how do we make really smart decisions about um, the impact of programs and, and whether or not we're investing resources in them. And um, Krista, a question for you with respect to design of the dashboard, were any of right. the APIs uh, over multiple years or were they all focused on current year performance? So we did both. We started with, we, we did current year performance, but also now the dashboard has kind of evolved over time. It also looked at some historical trend data in certain areas. Not everything because it would clutter it up so much and be so hard to process. Um, but looking, for example, like with our fundraising, how does this trend historically? Um, how does this trend historically with, with our Luna, um, et cetera? So those are some, some key places where we thought having that historical trend data would be helpful. We include it. Thank you. And for those of you who haven't joined us in the past, um, LUNA is a representation of liquid reserves. It's literally the acronym that represents liquid unrestricted net assets. And um, for many organizations, it's become vocabulary that's common to the board. It is um, a very common indicator for boards to focus focus on the balance of liquid reserves, which serves so many purposes in, in so many different ways for organizations. Thank you for that. I find that um, often organizations struggle between um, multi-year data as well uh, instead of or in addition to current year. And so this, this story of um, which indicators really you want to watch over time versus the ones you want to watch quarterly is one of those trade-offs that you'll want to make. As to said, perhaps over time, expand. So as I um, continue to think about this, I want to uh, turn it over uh, now for Up Valley's uh, KPIs and the choices that you made. Jenny. So as I was saying, uh, when we when we first started this, we had just come off of a merger, and so thinking about what we wanted to track uh, was a discussion. We had lots of ideas that's uh, not uncommon to what Krista was saying in terms of so many things that are possible to track. And we tried to keep it narrow at first, knowing that this was a new effort for us, uh, new both in terms of the organization, but also this, is, this was a practice that hadn't been done at either of the previous organizations prior to merging was having a dashboard to you know really center our conversations uh, we have uh, on our board we've got three committees that kind of break up into the three areas that you see on your screen um, and we also have lead staff who represent those areas so it was a combination of our committee leads and our lead staff in those areas choosing what we would focus on in the first uh, in the first year um, on a quarterly basis. And then we, um, from there, you know, have made some shifts, um, in particular around finance. Um, those metrics are looked at on a monthly basis um, now uh, because, you know, when the board meets, uh, they're looking specifically at those. But initially, we started quarterly, um, and it was not uh, really um, – it was already information that we needed to gather. It was just a matter of centering ourselves around the conversation. And we chose uh, the liquid unrestricted net assets really to, again, knowing that we are newly merged, trying to get a sense of um, what, what was that looking like? What, you know, what did we have in our operations to work with and making choices around um, how that would go forward? In terms of an operating surplus and deficit, it was really understanding when was our revenues likely to come in. And it was a learning experience for all of us because we had some new funding streams and different funding streams coming through. In terms of program, that was sort of a challenging one because we were merging, we're making decisions around how we were restructuring some programs. And so initially we really just decided to get a sense of, okay, who do we think we're actually serving now with a wider geographic region and um and what you know what's the ethnic breakdown that we think we're serving it didn't get as deep as we wanted to and then and we can talk about this later but we did really make tweaks to this area because it wasn't answering the deeper questions it was a good snapshot initially 
um, and, and, and helpful to understand how clients were um, perceiving our services, particularly in that first year. Uh, but what we're really interested in is what are our outcomes um, in, in our specific program areas. So we've moved, uh, moved there now. And then in terms of fundraising communications, you know, we, uh, again, we were operating on our best judgment about what we thought was possible around some events and some um, donors and possibly lapsed donors who could come back to us um, once the merger dust settled. And so we wanted to really track how we were doing in that area uh, and, and where were we exceeding goals and where might we uh, shore up efforts or rethink our strategy around fundraising. And then lastly, communications. Um, the board was really interested in tracking um, what types of coverage and, and, and the, the balance in the communities that we serve, because that was a tension initially when we merged was that one community might get more presence or, or more focus than another. And we wanted to really kind of see how that was playing out and then appropriately address it um, if we felt like it was out of balance. That was really helpful. And I, I want to kind of reemphasize that one of the things that I think was great about the way you designed the process is that you actually lined up the dashboard with regard to leadership and governance and each committee lead and each staff lead looking at their dashboard as the road for them to follow in this again um, this playbook for the new for the new organization so that that sounds like a really great way to connect leadership governance and these statistics that um, that we're reporting on i want to stay with you jenny and ask you a question that um, I often find this is really a way to see the value of dashboard um, reporting and, and that is, is there an example um, of a decision that you've made along the way that you feel was more informed because you had these statistics at your fingertips, the, the KPIs? Uh, there, are, there are a couple. One, I think the, the most prominent one has to do in the program realm because as we were looking at our metrics, we started having conversations about, okay, it's great that uh, you know our, our clients are expressing satisfaction at a high level or higher than we expected on our programs, but how do we know that our programs are having the desired impact that we want beyond what a client might say? and the challenges with client reports. Um, and so that really led us to, and Krista had mentioned they, they were going through a theory of change process. It really led us to a deeper conversation around what is it that we're trying to achieve and where do we see our added val value in the community? And as we began to think about what outcomes to track, we realized we as a new organization need a theory of change that ties everything together. And so we're now in that process and it led us very organically in some way. It allowed us to have the conversations to get us to the point of recognition that we need a theory of change, and then that theory of change will help us tie our data to specific outcomes. So we are currently in that process. That was one big decision. And then the second that I would just uh, mention is that in the course of this year that we first did it and tracking our, our budget and our fundraising, uh, there was a the Valley Fire hit, which was very close to our Calistoga office and impacted our, we were one of the responders to, to that crisis. And uh, what ended up happening was a significant number of donations were coming in to us to support um, victims of the fire, which was not, was completely unanticipated. And we decided and took a moment at, because we really, it was an anomaly that would not normally happen in a year we decided that we would track those donations and our and 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 look at that separately from non valley fire donations for example and so that was also um, it was a decision to make because we wanted to have an understanding of how we were really um, doing separate and apart from from that incident that and and it really actually also showed an impact in our in our budget in our in our financials as well because obviously we were getting this other stream that we hadn't anticipated. So it allowed us to have conversations and to visually graphically see what was happening, you know, 
after the second quarter that um, was quite different than what we were anticipating. I think that's a great example. Uh, Oftentimes, the budget to actual, the nature of what's causing the variance is, is hard to see. We have a positive variance, but the why, your ability to break that out, um, I bet was really, really helpful to, to the organization. Um, so turning back to you, um, Krista, what, what are some of the uh, questions that you were um, wrestling with that you think um, were easier to answer and more impactful because you had the dashboard? Well, I can think of an example on the growth and scale side and then one on the programmatic side. I think first with growth and scale, we were really having to make some decisions about one of our programs that we were doing across multiple counties and just seeing on the dashboard time after time how much unrestricted dollars we were having to dump into the program. Um, and despite all of our best efforts to find other ways to raise funds for it, really that along with some emerging research on the school to prison pipeline really helped facilitate a conversation at our agency director level to say wow we should really scale down this program focus it in on one county where we can get a lot more percentage of these costs covered experiment with this new model and if the new model works and think about scaling it back up and so that was a decision that we made and seeing the financial metrics about you know, what are we investing in and what are we buying i think that's become a conversation that we've had a lot. Like, let's think about it. We're, we're purchasing the, the opportunity to do something for clients, and where is that? Um, so that that was a really interesting conversation. I think also for us, we really had these aspirations of going into a third jurisdiction, into a third county, and we really believed that we would need to have some operational reserves available for multiple years for us to be able to do that. Um, and so having the dashboard where we could see where we were with our cash, we could see the operational reserves growing, we could see the unrestricted dollars growing and the restricted dollars shrinking, made the board and the staff much more comfortable to approve budgets and said, yeah, over the next three years, we're going to do some strategic drawdowns to invest in our ability to go into this new community, which we've since done. Um, and I think that was, that was really facilitated the comfort level to make that strategic choice from seeing the dashboard, um, you know, time after time, I think was really helpful. I think on the programmatic side, what was really interesting was for some of the metrics when we would present the dashboard quarterly, you'd say to the board, well, this, we won't have the answers to this until Q4. Um, and so we started having conversations internally saying, wow, for a lot of these metrics we really care about, by the time we have the data, it's the data is the data. It's too late to change anything. It's, we can't do anything about it. And that really opened up a whole conversation around program health indicators, which is what we call them internally. So for um, metrics that we're measuring around, you know, school engagement or graduation or recidivism that we measure annually that appear on the dashboard, what are the things we need to be measuring along the way to give us confidence that that's going to trend in the right direction? Um, because it was one of those metrics that we would kept reminding the board, look, this can only get worse. It will not, recidivism will not get better. The number can only decrease over time. Um, and then that's really led to an evolution of the programmatic dashboard we're presenting to the board, which we've been revising this year. But it really spurred conversations internally about how do we really assess the health of our programs in an ongoing way um, and, and be able to make changes as, our, as we need to, to to benefit our clients. And what you, what you mentioned there, Krista, I want to emphasize um, the, the, the process that you identified to get to programmatic indicators of, of health for the program. Um, there's a concept of leading indicators and lagging indicators, and um, uh, many of the of the metrics that we have shared in the prior slides were were um, lagging indicators. They're they're indicators that show you what has happened. Leading indicators give you some predictive index for what might happen. And so, by by starting to look at indicators of programmatic health. Um, in some cases, it's simply a 10. So if you have an earned revenue stream that is based on the number of seats in a daycare center, looking at attendance um, that may be reimbursed by a government contract, you can start to predict that because we didn't have the attendance two months down the road, we'll see that our revenue numbers will go down. So in that example, maybe we need to strategize on increasing attendance so that attendance will be met and therefore the lagging indicator of government revenue will be there. So I wanted to highlight the importance when you think of KPIs for, for those of us who are thinking about the dashboard, 
which will be the leading indicators, which often are at a much more detailed level, but together form the story that leads to the lagging indicators, which would be the results of, of operations in, in my example. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for that. I think I want to bring the questions now to a level of some of you in the, uh, listening might be wondering, how long does it take? How often do you do this? How many people are involved? And um, maybe, Jenny, can you tell us a little bit about um, how long does it take to update your dashboard and how often do you uh, issue the dashboard? Uh, we, it, it's essentially now that we've identified what we're tracking and a, a process for doing so, we've got systems in place. So our financials, our, our operations director puts that together and those are, um, those are on a monthly basis. Um, and it's it's not challenging at all. She's not using any special programs or anything like that. We're talking Excel primarily, um, and it's just you know a formatted, all, you know all of the all of the presentation is there. It's just put, plugging the numbers in. Um, in terms of the the program, uh, as I mentioned, we're on hold. But initially, um, again, we just used some charts in Excel and then presented them that way and our fundraising is um, track we track that monthly um, and uh, present that information to the board um, it's it's even actually more granular than that our development director is really really tracking it um, so it's it's just a matter of presenting the information that we already have in in the format it's it's not challenging to do once we know what we're tracking Thank you. Krista, do you have a similar or different approach to how you actually update it and how often you update it? Very similar and different people own different parts of the dashboard. So our finance team will own the finance part and then that part of the dashboard will be looked at more deeply by our finance committee. Um, our program folks manage the program piece, talent, talent piece, fundraising development really all told when we're talking about pulling it all together for the board on a quarterly basis, it takes maybe an hour, um, but things are happening on a, on a monthly basis where it's constantly being updated and we're using it internally. I think the important thing though that I would emphasize is that the upfront work is significant um, because it opens up really deep conversations about where you are as an agency and what you value. And, and it's dashboards I think really help the agency develop, enhance, or create a culture of being more data-driven and more outcome accountable. And so that can be really comfortable and like, oh, yay, we're so glad this is finally happening for some, and really intimidating and uncomfortable for others. Um, and so the process of agreeing upon the metrics um, and also getting the board on board really took some time. And you find people process information very differently. So for we had to figure out what are the compromises, and people were having conversations of everything from color to should we have a little narrative box that explains what this dashboard is about um and you know we leverage we had an outside person actually come roll it out to our board and really help the board understand this is why having a dashboard is important this is the best practices here's what we think and what we really asked is we said look this is not going to be perfect despite all the iterations we've gone through there's going to be things you you hate about this dashboard and we're going to ask you to try it for a full fiscal year Let's try it for a full fiscal year, keep a list of your complaints and things you don't like, both for the board and for the staff. And at the end of the year, once you've really allowed the muscle to develop as using this new way of being and thinking, if those complaints are still there, we'll address them and we'll fix them. And I have to say, most of them, by the end of that year, it, what was so um, salient for some of us at the beginning of the year just did not matter anymore by the end. Um, so I'm glad in retrospect that we, we took that approach. Love it. And did this come after a strategic plan of some sort or how, at what moment in time did you feel that it was best to start the process? It was messy. It was when we were in the middle of figuring out what is our theory of change? What is our strategic plan? You know, we, we were moving along that direction and so that process had been started, but it definitely wasn't finalized. Um, but I, I think for me, as we think about it, it was really about building the agency's muscle to think differently differently and make decisions and to have conversations a little bit differently. So we really were upfront that as the organization evolves, this will change. So it's as much about building the muscle as really being super wedded to the specific metric that we're picking. Because what's important today as the organization grows is going to be very different tomorrow. And, and that's okay. Um, it's interesting. I will say, you know, we're now four years into using a dashboard, but the financial metrics really haven't changed. 
the fundraising metrics really haven't changed. It's more around the dashboard we've developed around programmatic um, and also talent. Those are the things that we're looking at, I think, in a much more nuanced and sophisticated way. Um, and we started really narrowly. Like when we started, we said, look, we're just going to look at the metrics around this particular aspect of talent or this particular program. And as we built the muscle, then we expanded it out and said, okay, now we're going to look at metrics around a variety of different things. But it was, it was phased in. And just one last question um, I would ask both of you, and then we're going to turn to Q&A for those attending today. As an executive director, as the leader of the organization, um, how have you felt the dashboard has helped you bringing the team and the board um, to these conversations, um, specifically from the perspective of your role connecting the governance function to the staff um, leadership function? And I'll let one of you decide um, who wants to go first. Whoever, whoever responds first gets to go first. Well, I think for us, I, you know, it's, it's been helpful. I, I really resonate with what you said, Krista, about the, the process of the development of it and, and the engagement, because I think what it allowed is it allowed the different leaders within the organization, whether uh, committee chairs on the board or whether their staff leads to, to own their piece and feel clear about talking about it and asking questions and engaging others around it. So I feel like it helped me because I, I had more of a team uh, working with me, even though the process of getting it there is challenging. And we're definitely in that mode right now with the program pieces. And, and we have a wider group thinking about it and talking about it. But I believe that through that process, there, there begins to have more alignment and people do come at uh, thinking about it from different perspectives. So, it, and it's helpful to get those out. And I think that's what uh, the process allows. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Uh, I think for me, I really echo with what you just said, Jenny, in terms of building the team. And, and I think also building a sense of shared accountability that these are metrics that we should all all care about and we should all understand internally as directors and also as a board um, and so that sense of, of togetherness uh, was I think really um, helpful I also think for me it was really liberating uh, because I really struggled um, especially with board members to distill a lot of complexity and nuances and intricacies into to messages that made it meaningful and helpful for board members to engage and give us their best thinking and so having having the dashboard done, really when I do the updates is here's where the organizational health is, I'll say, as we can see on our dashboard, here's what I here's the, the, the top line about where we are from an organizational health perspective. And it's 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 very helpful. Um, and it and it really helps me, I think, for be a more efficient communicator and a more efficient um, manager of of the folks around me and uh, helping bring out our best. Thank you. And any tool that can do that is a really valuable tool. Um, I want to now turn to Q&A. Um, before I do that, I wanted to, to let everyone know that those of you who are listening in and who will be downloading uh, or would like to download this in the future, we have put together a chart of sample key performance indicators across all of those nine areas. And remember, the key to key is that it be a few. But we thought it would be helpful for you to see what other organizations, including the two panelists today, other organizations, um, key metrics to maybe spark some thinking um, for you. So please feel um, free to download and um, use this as a reference tool for yourself as you start to, to build your dashboard. Um, Ruth, I'm going to ask you to help us now with any questions that may have come in. We still have some time. Um, okay. There were a lot of questions, but I will say the number one question from people was, where are these dashboards you're talking about? Can't I look at them? Um, and so I, I do want to say to people that it, we, we felt like we were a little bit already imposing on people to um, to explain their dashboards and we we did, didn't necessarily know how to kind of exhibit them um, in the time that we had but, but we do actually have some really great examples of dashboards in some previous material that we've done um, and so so all of you will be getting some material after this webinar that um, will show you what 
components of dashboards look like. I will tell you though um, that, and and please anybody in the on the panel, um, argue with me if you like. It is a very personal kind of a thing. I mean, you may think that oh, this would be great to show in a pie chart, and it just doesn't give you the information you need, or that the comparatives need to be between years, but then it's not between years that you need, it's between months. Um, and it, it, over time, I think the quality of the information develops with the conversation. Would you agree with that? Any of you? Jenny, Kristen? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think it's it's interesting, and there's and there's places where you have to also make compromises. There's parts of the dashboard that I'm like, oh, if this was up to me, I would so not present it this way. But the Finax folks on the board were like, oh, this is this is how we see the numbers the best. So that's it's an interesting place too as a leader to to have to make some of those key decisions about which audience needs to have their comfort be prioritized on certain parts of those key metrics. Um, and it does, it does change and evolve over time too. And especially for us, like we have term limits on our board. So we're finding that as new board members come in, what, the, what, how they operate the best and what we need to provide them to get their best thinking, that changes too. Right. So I, I wanted to just um, talk a minute about, uh, because there were a number of questions also just about what software do you use? And I know that you guys have said, well, we kind of just use Excel. <laughs> Um, and that's what I've heard from a lot of people as well. This does not require necessarily any special tools. It requires really clear thinking. But is that your experience that that you can essentially, you know, use Excel to exhibit what it is that you're trying to watch? So I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, and then uh, our other colleagues could absolutely add. I think the, the issue of the software is um, is a complicated one for many reasons. One, we never want the software to stand in the way of the actual process. And so we often begin with Excel, or some people have a really basic red, yellow, green dashboard on four metrics. The, the value of Excel is that it can pull data from different sources. From the data points that we just covered, some data is coming from finance. So that will come from your, from your accounting system. You have data on fundraising, and that's coming from your fundraising system. And then you have program. We heard that Krista measures talent. So it's very, very difficult to expect that one software will do all that. Each of the software in each of those disciplines will have Think of them as subsidiary dashboards, but when you consolidate, that's the beauty of Excel. At a much more complex level, there are enterprise level systems that will extract data from different sources and pull it together to actually present. Um, that aspect of technology is more expensive. It requires a bit more design. So we encourage you to take, take, it, take it in a staged um, approach. The Excel approach requires a little bit of training on Excel, but you have the flexibility to record and track what you'd like as opposed to what's standard on a particular package. So that those are my thoughts. Um, Krista and Jenny, if you want to add anything on that. Oh, I, I think we had an experience where we, we worked in, with um, a volunteer at one point to help us create a dashboard, and it was in a system that we just couldn't easily manipulate or change. So once the volunteer was out of the picture, we just were kind of lost. Um, and so this time when we, we did it, exactly, we used Excel so that that way it's something that's relatively um, user-friendly um, and doesn't depend on a particular person. It's something we can train people on pretty quickly and pretty easily. You know, I wanted I wanted to um, to move along to thinking about what this really is. Someone asked uh, asked in the questions, "Is this just a financial report?" And I can't tell you to what degree that really understates it. Um, so, you know, I wanted to put back together for a minute to go back to something that Krista was talking about. And I think Jenny, you talked about it too, which is the relationship between theories of change and the dashboard. Because you may think, well, this is our theory of change. And 
the dashboards can actually give you the opportunity to test that theory. And if you find that that theory is not working, it essentially allows you a real-time capability of saying, wait a second, maybe this isn't working the way we thought it would. Um, and maybe we need to measure something else. Maybe we need to develop a new theory of change. And I think that's one of the most valuable uses of a dashboard is that it actually tracks things in enough real time to tell you when you're entirely on the wrong course in terms of what you're measuring and what you're expecting out of what efforts. I was so that, that said, I want to talk for I want to ask for a minute. One of the things that really impressed me is that, you know, I'm always talking with boards about why don't boards measure the amount of unrestricted money in their budgets? Um, like, why isn't that much more a focus of people's attention? Because it makes such a huge difference to the way the organization functions. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that, Krista. Why was that such a focus in what you did? We had a lot of ambitions about how we wanted to elevate and add value to the world and maximize our impact. And um, we also really felt that with the mission and the work and our target population, um, that a lot of times our hands were really tied with what we could we could do. What also we found was we were tying our hands even further with how we were interpreting whether there was a restriction or not. And we were erring on the side of restricting assets that actually when we went back and took a look at it, were not as restricted as we were making them. And so what was happening was we were hesitant to make investments in infrastructure or hesitant to make some of the investments in talent. Um, or hesitant to make some of the investments in growth because the only way to do that was by using some of our unrestricted dollars. So for us, it was really helpful to understand um, what that looked like. And also from scale, it was helpful to say, you know, we, when it comes to fundraising, we were making really significant efforts to fundraise across our program portfolio. But looking at it, especially over time, historically we were seeing that certain programs were more successful at raising restricted dollars than others which also gave us insight as to if we're gonna go into new jurisdictions or we're going to scale programs, where's the financial demand that will give us the foundation to get a program started? Um, and so being able to see that um, more quickly and readily was really helpful for us in having those conversations. And if Ruth, if I could add to that, um, often there's a, there's a, a sort of the inverse problem where um, organizations do not separate unrestricted and restricted dollars. And so there's this performance as a whole, but at the end of the day, if the organization is not delivering on the restrictions from those restricted dollars and the release from those restrictions is not possible, either because the performance wasn't there or as a result of the year-end audit, the accountability wasn't there, um, the availability in terms of um, operating surplus or deficit is a very different number. So segregating those on a quarterly basis and seeing um, how those releases are happening also is a helpful tool to manage all that restricted funding so that folks do not feel that they have more than they actually really do have available um, to, for general operations. Right. I think I think what's interesting about the way you're talking about it, though, is that you end up being able, by what you measure, you end up being able to focus the conversation very acutely on some things that might otherwise be lost um, in terms of their importance to the way the organization functions. So Jenny, um, I just want to go back to you really uh, quickly. And um, I just think it is fascinating um, the, the, you know, to measure um, the question of what to measure after a merger to understand what else you may need to do to secure the future of those of uh, you know the unified future i just like to maybe end on hearing a little bit more about that because that is a very complex situation i imagine with a lot of um various ideas about what success looks like Mm -hmm. And I just a, a little bit more about what exactly you did measure post merger um, and whether that changed over the course of time. 
Well, I, one of the, the the ways in which we the data helped us in the realm of fundraising is we took a look at our performance that year, that first year, and we made we changed some of our fundraising goals as a result of uh, understanding and seeing you know what the, what our results were and actually we we did better in some areas than we thought but we were being conservative because we weren't quite sure what to expect so in that realm um it allowed us uh to to set some more realistic goals for the future and then in terms of the program as we were alluding to in the whole theory of change process one of the things that we did uh that, that we did recently was invest in a um, client, a new client program database and one of the things that we're now really in the middle of through the theory of change process is identifying what are those key metrics that we're tracking to show the kind of progress that you know and to be able to track the kind of progress that we're having so we're still I mean you know as we've been talking about it is definitely an iterative process and what we've you know we're we're learning as we're going and the one thing I was going to say earlier was, you know, um, on the program end of things, there are lots of different ways uh, nonprofits um, track programs, but often there are also uh, tools there to show to show the the metrics and the progress um, that you know also can be done in Excel. But I think that for us, we're really in that process of um, negotiating what are those what are those things. Great. Thank you so much, all of you. I, I mean, I learned so much and I, you know, it sparked so many thoughts in my head about the many ways in which um, you can use this particular process. I do want to say that um, there are a lot of people who are saying I could sit through another hour. Um, and also a lot of people who, um, who say that they would like to see uh, more models. and. We are all about bringing you that. Um, so don't make sure you don't wander away too far because we will be bringing you more on this topic. And I just very, uh, again, very much appreciate people being so honest about what, about what that process was like. My own experience with this is that you kind of have to get your hands into it um before it really becomes real to you it's that kind of thing don't focus on the tools um focus on the process and and the the idea that there are some lever leveraging strategies there are always some leveraging strategies that can make your work better and the point is to try to find what those are for you it may be liquidity it, it may be unrestricted cash um, and, and, you know, it could be any number of things. It could be, you know, uh, for, for us, it, it, we had to understand some things, like one thing did not necessarily compute to another. Um, and that was like gold because it meant we would stop doing things that weren't productive and start trying things that were productive. So for all of you that are out there and you're, we're all big experimenters to make um, our work better, um, we'll just stay in this conversation for a while as we go along. We'll have more and more examples of how dashboards relate to various business models. And we'll have more wonderful guests like Jenny and Krista um, and Hilda to help educate us all. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, we will see you next time. We will be sending you copies of materials, including um visual copies of dashboards thank you thank you everyone have a great day thank you thank you